everyone. This slide is about how we can count bacteria from different types of milk. So in this slide, you're going to learn about how we can look at differences in raw milk versus pasteurized milk versus fermented milk. And I'm more interested in you guys learning about dilutions and bacterial colonies, not necessarily just about the milk because the method that you're gonna learn about in this experiment can be used with not just milk, anything that we want to count bacteria off of and know if there's contamination, we use this method called the standard plate count method. But to start off, we'll start off with some background about milk since this experiment is specifically addressing bacteria in milk. So raw milk comes directly from the animal and that's the definition of raw milk. Nothing has been done to it, it's straight from the cow or any other animal that gives you milk. And when it comes out from the animal, straight when it comes out, it has very few microbes in it, but it's such a rich, nutritious source that it can easily quickly grow microbes. So that's why we're really worried about pathogenic bacteria, which are bacteria that cause disease, or spoilage bacteria, which are bacteria that basically ruin food. They ruin the taste of food. And so because milk is so nutritious, it can easily grow microbes. So just know when it first comes out, it doesn't have a, lot, a very high count of microbes. But because it is so nutritious, like I said, it can really easily and quickly get contaminated with microbes. So that's why typically when people, people who drink raw milk um, will usually collect it and boil it right away and store it in the fridge. Or if they get it, they'll put it in the refrigerator rather quickly because it can get contaminated, contaminated easily. Three major ways that raw milk can get contaminated with microbes is one, if the animal has a breast infection or or other infection called mastitis, it can pass on the microbes in its breast to the milk that's being expressed. Another way is that microbes can get into the milk from the surface of the animal's breast by the normal skin flora that just like we have skin bacteria and skin flora animals do too, or environmental contacts. And the animal's breast can also become uh, more contaminated with manure, dirt, bedding, or feed, wherever the animals are. And then third, the final way that raw milk can easily get contaminated is through milking equipment and dairy workers. That's why you want to make sure that the equipment that the farmers are working with or whoever's working with is super sterile and dairy workers are also making sure to be covered up and make sure that they're not exposing the milk to anything by their clothes, by their hands, their shoes, anything like that. And keep in mind that when we look at bacteria that's growing in raw milk, or as we call them, contaminants, they're not all pathogenic. So a lot of them can just be normal microbiota. But if pathogens do get into raw milk and they do grow, they can make someone very sick. Examples of pathogens that are typically seen in raw milk, if it is contaminated, are Campylobacter bacteria, E. coli, specifically the Shiga toxin producing E. coli. So this is an E. Coli that produces a toxin that causes food poisoning. Salmonella, Brucella, Listeria, all of these bacterial species can make someone very sick and they can cause all these different infections. And keep in mind with all of these infections, they typically all have the same symptoms where someone has abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. So kind of very typical of food poisoning. These are what you would experience if you do have some sort of milk illness, which I think a lot of people have gotten in their lifetime. And Raw milk and raw milk products are illegal in some states, so keep that in mind because they can eat, like I said, they can easily grow microbes. A lot of st states have said, well, why deal with this? Why not just make all milk pasteurized or milk products such as cheeses? But raw milk and raw milk products, especially raw milk cheeses, are legal in California. And a lot of people who do drink raw milk believe that it has better nutritional value. So they say that the things we do to milk, like pasteurization, and I'll talk about that, may remove some of the nutritional value. But a lot of studies have shown that 
it's very minimal and pasteurization doesn't really do anything, but there's still a lot of studies being done. And just know that a lot of symptoms of milk-borne illnesses can be very serious and major complications can occur, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome. And then for pregnant women, pregnant women are not supposed to eat any raw milk products, raw milk and raw milk cheeses, because listeria, which can easily contaminate raw milk, can cause miscarriage. So now we get into pasteurization. So that was raw milk. Pasteurization it, um, does not change nutritional properties much. What it does is it inactivates a lot of enzymes that are in milk. And these enzymes don't really do much for human health. But a lot of people who argue that raw milk is healthier say that raw milk has higher, for example, vitamin C or enzymes that are not denatured or ruined by pasteurization. So pasteurization was developed many years ago by Louis Pasteur, and it's a method of heat treating raw milk. And the reason we do this is so that we don't get any spoilage organisms. And by doing that, you get increased shelf life and to kill pathogenic bacteria. Now, I want everyone to do an experiment. If you have not already um, done this or seen this, go to the milk section next time you go to the supermarket and look at... Uh, pasteurized milk and then what they call ultra pasteurized milk and look at the expiration and you'll notice that ultra pasteurized milk has an expiration date that's like two months out and that's because the ultra pasteurized milk is very pasteurized milk so they've removed so many path uh, spoilage organisms as well as pathogenic but more we're more concerned with spoilage organisms that the milk can last for a really long time versus if you go to like whole foods for example and you see raw milk. Raw milk has a very small shelf life, so expiration is very quick. And what pasteurization is, is high heat, high heat for a very short time. So we see the definition of it is basically flash heating. And so the milk goes in the pasteurization, it gets heated really quickly. So it's uh, 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. So that's why it's flash heating. And just know that pasteurization does not sterilize milk. The definition of sterilization is removing all microbial life. And the reason why we do not sterilize milk is sterilizing will remove remove a lot of the nutrition. So the vitamins, the nutrients, all of that. So that's why we do pasteurization. Pasteurization is great. And keep in mind that pasteurization isn't just with milk. It can also be done with juice. So now we talked about raw milk and pasteurized milk. The next milk I want to talk about is fermented milk. Fermented milk is in you can make fermented milk using, using either raw milk or pasteurized milk as a starting point. And fermented milk is basically milk that has bacteria added to it, and it's good bacteria added to it. So yogurts and cheeses are an example of fermented milk, cultured buttermilk. So it's milk that we've added beneficial bacteria to. So scientists in lab add it or in factories, they add good bacteria such as lactobacilli, lactococcus, streptococcus, yeast, um, saccharomyces. So all of these are added and they promote fermentation. And with fermentation, you get byproducts of fermentation that make the food taste better. One byproduct of fermentation is lactic acid, for example. And lactic acid gives us that good yogurt flavor. And also the very high acidity of lactic acid inhibits a lot of spoilage organisms and these are what we consider probiotics because we have the good bacteria in fermented milk and probiotics or good bacteria they help promote better intestinal health because if someone is taking antibiotics especially broad spectrum antibiotics which target gram positive gram negative all types of bacteria they the antibiotics kill the good bacteria too so that's why probiotics are important they keep the good bacteria in your gut or intestines. Okay, so now we talked about a little bit about the background of pasteurized milk, raw milk, and fermented milk, or an example of fermented milk, for example, is cultured buttermilk, or yogurt is another example. So the point of this lab, what you are going to do is we're going to take these three milk products, and we were going to count the number of viable, viable means live bacteria present in one milliliter of milk sample. One milliliter is about this much. So we were, you were going to determine how much bacteria is in one milliliter of pasteurized milk, raw milk, and 
fermented milk. Now, before we actually do this experiment, we can think about it a little bit. So pasteurized milk really shouldn't have any bacteria in it. Uh, and raw milk technically really shouldn't have any bacteria in it unless something got in or someone's hands. I mean, it can easily get contaminated by many different sources, but if people drink raw milk, most people are fine. And then fermented milk does actually have bacteria in it. So to count bacteria, what you're going to do is you're going to use a method called the standard plate count method, which is also called the viable plate count method. And the reason we do this method to count bacteria is because if we were actually going to directly count bacteria, it would be way too tiring and too much work. So we've developed this method, the standard plate count method. And the idea behind this method is that you take your original source, which in this case is either pasteurized milk, raw milk, or fermented milk, and you dilute it, and then those dilutions you plate on agar plates, and then you count the bacteria on the different diluted plates. And we also use this method with studying bacterial infection. So if you are studying if an animal can be infected by bacteria, you can inject the bacteria in an animal such as a mouse and let the infection progress, and then you can isolate their for example, if you're studying stomach infection, you can isolate their stomachs. And I know this does harm the animal, but if you're studying it for a good cause, trying to study stomach cancer or something like that, which can be caused by bacteria, you can take those stomachs and then you can do dilutions of them and then plate them on different agar plates. So just know that we use this method with a lot of different things, but we're using it to calculate bacteria from milk right now. And so again, there could be hundreds of bacteria in one milliliter of milk and no one's going to sit and count hundreds of bacteria. So we do the standard plate count method. The way it works to summarize the slide, because you guys have these notes, is we take one, mil one milliliter of each milk sample. So raw milk, pasteurized milk, and fermented milk. And we do a series of dilutions and we call this a serial dilution. So we're progressively decreasing the amount of bacteria if there is bacteria so that we can count them on an agar plate. So what you do is you take your milk and I'll describe it and you dilute it um, multiple times, you do multiple dilutions, and then those multiple dilutions of your milk, you mix them with agar. So you just take all the dilutions and you mix it with agar, you swirl it a little, and then you pour the agar on a Petri dish, which are the little circular dishes, and then you let it cool and you incubate it. This technique that I just explained is called the pour plate technique, because you mix your sample, which in our case is milk and the agar, and then you pour it on a Petri dish and then you incubate the plates and then you come back and you count the bacteria on your plates. And we count bacterial colonies. We specifically count colony forming units or CFUs. Colony forming units and colonies are basically the same thing. That we just use a different term, colony forming units, which specifies that a colony can be formed by multiple organisms. But just for um, the sake of making it a little bit easy, just think about them as being very similar or the same thing. And again, with a pour plate technique, you take your sample, which in our case is milk, and you mix it with the agar, you swirl it, then you pour it, that's why it's called the pour plate technique, on a petri plate, and then you just swirl it a little until it cools, then you stick it in the incubator. And I'm going to talk about the cereal dilution here before I show the results. So the, our milk, we dilute it. So we take one milliliter of our original milk. So if we, you had been doing this in lab, one group would be working with pasteurized milk, one group would be working with raw milk, and then one group would be working with fermented milk. And then what you would do, like if I was working with raw milk, I would take one milliliter of the raw milk and then mix it with it just water, basically, to dilute it or agar. So you mix it with water or agar, whatever you're using, and I've diluted it, and that's 10 to the minus one dilution. And then you take that dilution that you created, and you take one milliliter of that, and you dilute that even more. And then that's a 10 to the minus two dilution, or one to 100 dilution. Then you take one milliliter of that, and you mix it with, let's say, water, and that's one to the 10 to the minus 
three, sorry, that's one to a thousand dilution or 10 to the minus three dilution and keep going. And just keep in mind that your first dilution is the most concentrated. And as you go down, you get all very dilute. So the least concentrated bacteria. So 10 to the minus one dilution is the most concentrated. 10 to the minus five dilution is the least concentrated. So it's the most dilute. And so then when you do your pour plate technique, you incubate those plates and you should look at the colonies. Now the plate with the least dilution, which is 10 to the minus one or the most concentration will have a lot of bacteria on it. So we'll see when we see bacteria everywhere, we call that a lot of bacteria. And then as you go on, we should see less bacterial colonies. And so you count these colonies. And so after that your plates have been incubated, you count the number of colonies. And we're trying to count, remember the whole goal of this experiment is to count the number of bacterial colonies in one milliliter of milk. So the formula that we use to do this calculation, and this is done in labs all the time, milk dairy labs, is CFU per milliliter. So we're gonna count the number of colony forming units or colonies per milliliter of milk. This formula, the way it works is you count the number of colonies on your plates and you you divide it by the, uh, the volume plated, which for everyone is one, and you multiply that by the milk dilution. And I'll give an example of this. Um, actually, let me go to the next picture and I'll, I'll show how this is done. So before I get to that, I want to say that this is this method that I just described, the standard plate count method, it will always underestimate the number of bacteria that's present in the actual sample. So uh, for us, the actual sample is like the milk carton. And the reason why it will always underestimate is that you cannot possibly grow all the bacteria in the world on in the conditions that we're growing them in. In lab, we try to mimic the best conditions that we think bacteria will grow up, but maybe not all bacteria in milk are aerobic or anaerobic. So that's why you have to keep in mind that this method will always underestimate the true number of bacteria because you can't possibly mimic all the conditions that all the bacteria will grow in. And then in California, the California Drug and Food Administration regulates milk sales. And just as a fact, I want you guys to know that for both raw milk and pasteurized milk, the maximum standard plate count for bacteria in that milk that's allowed is 15,000 CFUs per milliliter. So it is something that's seriously considered and done all the time. Scientists do this all the time. And here are potential results. So after you've done your dilutions, the serial dilutions that I talked about, and you've done the pour plate technique, you are going to take out your plates from the incubator. And remember, there were there would potentially be three groups in class. One group that did raw milk, one group that did fermented milk, and one group that did pasteurized milk. And so here's an example of plates. And these plates are from raw milk. So I want to focus on this top area. So this plate is a 10 to the minus one dilution, which is the most concentrated with bacteria. And it makes sense. Look, we see so many bacterial colonies. There's bacteria everywhere. And then we go down to 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two dilution, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four, and 10 to the minus five. This is not really showing in the picture, but this had no colonies on it. So we went from a lot of bacterial colonies to no colonies, which makes sense. This was very concentrated and this was very dilute. And now the idea is you're going to count the number of colonies on all these plates and do that formula that we talked about to calculate CFU per milliliter. And the main thing I want to say is that we do not count any plates that have more than 300 colonies. First of all, no one wants to sit and count 300 colonies. So any plate that looks like it has more than 300 bacterial colonies, we just write too numerous to count because you're not going to be accurate. And any plate that has, for example, two bacterial colonies, we don't use that in our calculation either because it's very few colonies to be accurate. So when we look at our plates, the best plates to use for doing the calculation are plates that have between 300 and 30 colonies. Anything more than 300 bacterial colonies, we write too numerous to count. And anything under 30 colonies, we typically dump those plates. So the best plates are plates that have like 
a hundred colonies or 50 colonies. So I went through and I used these plates as an example and did the calculations. So on the 10 to the minus one plate, this agar plate, I had too many bacteria. There are more than 300 colonies. So I wrote two numbers to count. And so in this column in your lab manual, it wants you to count the number of colonies or CFUs. And then in the next column, do the calculation. So this one is too numerous to count, so I'm not doing the calculation. On my next plate, the plate that had the 10 to the minus two dilution here, I counted the colonies and I got about 134 colonies. And the way you do the formula again from the last slide is you take your colonies and you divide them by the dilution. So there, here's 134 colonies divided by 10 to the minus two. And when I convert that to scientific notation, this um, milk has 1.34 times 10 to the fourth colony forming units per milliliter. And I did the same thing. So my 10 to the minus three plate, this one, it's not really showing, but when I actually had the plate in lab, it had 38 colonies. So I did 38 divided by 10 to the minus three, because that was my dilution on that plate. And I got 3.8 times 10 to the fourth. Now look at these two numbers right here. They're very similar. All of your numbers should be pretty similar because they're just different dilutions but the same source that we use keep that in mind so here from raw milk i determined that this raw milk has 10 to the 10 to the fourth actually not minus four i was saying that 10 to the fourth amount of bacteria typically and when we looked at our plates here's good class results pasteurized milk from my classes typically had no bacterial growth on any of the plates which made sense. It shouldn't have bacteria because it's pasteurized and pasteurization kills spoilage organisms and pathogenic organisms, or at least kills most of them. And then fermented milk had bacteria on it from the class because fermented milk has good bacteria actually put in the milk. So what I want everyone to learn from this experiment is to know what raw milk is. So raw milk is straight from the cow. We view the risks of drinking it. Why is it risky to drink it? How can raw milk get contaminated with microbes? We talked about the three ways. Define pasteurization and fermentation. So we talked about pasteurization. Remember, it's flash heating or high heat for a very brief period. And it's meant to limit spoilage bacteria and pathogenic bacteria. And then with fermentation, we are physically adding good bacteria to the milk source and it's important because that good bacteria is a source of probiotics. Probiotics help with your intestinal health. Um, especially for people who are taking antibiotics. And then we talked about cereal dilution and why it's done. Remember, the re if we didn't do any dilution and I just took one milliliter of milk and plated it on an agar, I'd see bacteria everywhere and I wouldn't be able to accurately count them. And it definitely would be over 300 colonies if actually that source was contaminated. So that's why we do a dilution. And so we start by diluting from the original source and then diluting that down and then we use the pour plate technique. Then we counted colonies and the name of the technique used was pour plate technique. Which plates would you use to count C or calculate CFU per milliliter? Remember that you use plates that have between 30 and 300 colonies and then I talked about why standard plate count estimates are always low because you cannot possibly grow all bacteria in lab, so they will always underestimate the amount of bacteria that we originally have. So I hope this makes sense, even though unfortunately we didn't get a chance to do this lab.